The scent of rain and lightning actually started with a landscape. There's a landscape in Kansas that I had never heard of before, and I think even most people who live in the state have never heard of it. It's out in western Kansas, and you have to imagine that you're in an area where there's lots of rolling ranch land, and then you come across this amazing landscape that's ground as flat as you can imagine, and it's white because it's chalky. And out of this white landscape rise these amazing rock monuments. They're like a natural Stonehenge. And they were formed millions of years ago, first by an inland sea that bisected the continent and went through what is now Kansas, and then by a river. Well, I looked at those monuments and I saw that there was a dramatic contrast between the flat land and these monuments that rise 80 feet in the air. They're just amazing. And something about that really spoke to me, about dramatic contrasts and about the startling things that can happen to human beings when they think their lives are going along on a certain trajectory. And out of that came the scent of rain and lightning, um, which also formed from a series of what ifs. And I think I would use these what ifs to tell people what the story is. What if there was a ranching family um, and they were influential and respected and good people? And what if the beloved eldest son of that family were murdered one night? And what if there was also in that town the ne'er-do-well kid, the one who's always getting in trouble, and he was the natural suspect? And as sometimes happens in underpopulated areas where there aren't very many people to suspect, he is rushed into prison and, and um, convicted of the crime. And what if years pass and two kind of remarkable things happen? One is that the daughter of the murder victim and the son of the man accused of murdering him fall in love. And then what if you also have the, the flat land of this wonderful ranching family <clears throat> who are so well respected and, and yet these fine people, out of the best of intentions, do some very bad things that have consequences all around the county. And so that's the story. It's the story of what may or may not have been a wrongful conviction for a murder. It's the story of what happens to lead up to that murder, the story of the murder itself, the story of, of how lives unfold and unwind and try to find their way back to normality after that dramatic effect. It's interesting how people become writers. A lot of us are encouraged to write from an early age, but we don't think of ourselves as fiction writers. And I was one of those writers. I spent most of all of my childhood and most of my youth thinking I would never have the imagination to be a novelist. Novelists were those special people who could do what I could only read. And then after about 13 years of having made a living as a writer in other ways, I had one of those epiphanies that that sometimes you're lucky enough to have in life, which was that it just hit me that all I ever wanted to do for the rest of my life was write novels. And I remember going to lunch with a friend and telling her how much I hated doing the work I was doing and how desperately I wanted to write fiction and, and that I just couldn't make up my mind what to do. And she said to me, she, it was one of those light bulb moments that really happened. She said to me, you know, the only thing that's wrong with you, Nancy, is that you're afraid to do it. I went home that day and I called all of my clients. I was doing freelance work and I gave them 30 days notice. And 30 days after that, without ever having written a novel in my life, I was working on fiction full time and within a few months finished my first novel got a short story published, had some luck, and then also a lot of rejections. But I've never looked back from that either. And I look back now and I realize that was the right decision to make. I had a similar moment a few years ago. Um, I had been writing mysteries for a long time that were set all over the place. And suddenly I had a, an epiphany about the fact that all I wanted to do was set books in Kansas, which is, is my home state. And that, too, was overwhelming and instantaneous and completely changed the course of my writing. So I've been really lucky to have had these two moments in my life that um, directed me exactly the way I needed to go and wanted to go. It was a funny, I guess you could even say challenging, moment to start writing about Kansas because Kansas had been receiving 
at that time, more so maybe than now, a lot of neg negative publicity. Um, some of that publicity was probably well deserved. But nevertheless, that combined with certain other stereotypes about the state both interested me and challenged me. Because if you ask the ordinary person to give you three words describing Kansas, they will give you flat and boring. And, and, and here I was wanting to write about a state that was getting negative publicity that was viewed very negatively by an awfully lot of people, including friends of mine, and um, that people thought it was boring. But I also knew that's not my Kansas. My Kansas is gorgeous. You go to the Flint Hills in the spring or the fall, and it's just a piece of heaven as far as I'm concerned. It's such beautiful country. Um, there are so many places in Kansas, like the, the area with the rock monuments that I've stolen for the scent of, hen of rain and lightning. So many geologically, geographically, historically, aesthetically, really interesting places in Kansas. And I wanted readers to be able to see that through my eyes, through the eyes of a writer who finds it beautiful. In my books about Kansas, it looks as if weather's playing a big role in almost all of them, in all of them so far, actually. Um, weather is a big deal in Kansas. We get dramatic weather. And um, because I've spent so much time in the countryside of Kansas, I have fallen in love with the more extreme weather, short of tornadoes, that we get. Because there's absolutely nothing, in my view, more spectacular than standing out on the prairie by yourself in a field. And you look to the west, and you see a black storm wall. And it's earth to further than you can see up, and it's as far in either direction as you can see, and it's coming toward you. I am a Nancy Drew girl. Um, there's a whole generation of us who are women mystery writers who are Nancy Drew girls, and we all came into the field at the same time. We tend to be American women of a certain age, and at, at, mysteriously, all at the same time, we seem to have started writing similar mystery series, and that's what I was doing for a long time. And and. All of us would show up at conventions of mystery readers and mystery writers, and everybody looked around and said, where did all these women come from? And we came from Nancy Drew, because Nancy was our role model. We really did read those books under the covers with the flashlights, and she was brave, and she was independent, and she was smart, and she was adventurous. She was all those things that maybe at that time of our lives we didn't feel we could be. So she was our heroine. And we couldn't find those books to read on the shelves at the time that our books were first coming out, which would have been late 70s, early 80s. And so we started writing the books that we wanted to read. In these books, I'm frequently going back and forth between time periods. And that is because of my deep desire to know how people get themselves in these fixes. And in order to do that, I want to go back in time, but I don't want to do it through flashbacks. I don't want to have two characters just talking to each other about what, ha what had happened. I want to be there on the scene. And so that requires me to go back in time to when some of these events had their beginning. Um, and then I want to go forward in time, and I like the suspense that can build when that happens. The thing about writing fiction is that, as is true, I suspect, of any profession, is that when you're doing it full time, and it means the world to you, what you're trying to do all the time is get better. And what, what getting better means is not necessarily the result. It's the process of the writing itself. Um, if you want to, for instance, present um, a dramatic incident from a particular character's point of view, it means going deeper and deeper into that character's point of view. And it takes a certain amount of maturity, possibly, to do that. So getting older and having more experience is helpful um, when you're a fiction writer, I think. I would love for readers to leave my books feeling the way I leave books that I love. And what is that feeling? It's a feeling of satisfaction. It's a feeling of, oh, I'm really glad I read this. And it's a feeling of, I will remember this, or I loved this character, and I'll never forget this character. That's how I want to feel when I 
close the book, no matter whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending, I want to feel satisfied and glad that I read it. And I want to know that I won't forget it.